Where does real Christianity now exist? Where do the Christians live? Who are those whose hearts cry out, My God and my all, I desire nothing but you. You are my glory, my delight, my crown. Those of whom we might describe as being rooted and grounded in love, who are being filled with all the fullness of God, those whose faith is bearing fruit, who live in the assurance of the hope they have found in Him, whose love for all neighbors is present in every thought, every word, each action. It is often thought that becoming a Christian is a relatively easy matter, but if that be so, why does the wider world wonder where they can be found? Could it be that we have settled for having a form of religion that lacks any true power? Is it possible that we have stopped short of the ultimate prize? In our comfort, has the church fallen asleep? And if she be found in slumber, is it possible for the church to hear the calling that has echoed throughout her history? Wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Where does real Christianity now exist? Dare we have the courage to set out on the long journey to find it once again? Well, good evening, everybody. There we go. Lovely to see you and to be here with you again. If we haven't met, my name is Julian Hobdi, and I'm the lead pastor for this service. I'm going to invite you right away. Turn to your Bibles. Let's pull them open. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible or a Bible reading device, then we will put on the screen. If you simply send me an email, we would love to get one to you. Uh, we, are, we are committed to find a way to get the resources into your hands. So if you simply send me an email at pastorjulian at fmcm.org, we will be glad to get one in your hands. Now, we are in the book of Romans in the eighth chapter. That's where we are this evening. We are going to move right into this message. I'm excited for it. I hope you came ready to eat, and I hope you have notes and paper and pens and Y'all know the drill at this point. Y'all know who I am. You know, I don't even need to pretend like I'm something other than what I am. Let's get ready to get to the text. All right, the reading goes this way. It's in Romans chapter 8, and the text reads like this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemns sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to, to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is a certain sense, I'm sure I've said this before, and if we've had conversations in passing, I know I've said it, but uh, there's a certain sense in which my own theology is undergirded by a threefold concept, life, love, and freedom. That's easy to remember, life, love, and freedom. Now, when I say that my own theology is undergirded in this way, I mean the way that I think, the way that I believe, the way that I talk about God is, is wrapped around this concept of life, love, and freedom. I know I've alluded to it in previous messages and in some I've outright said it, that God is love. God is the source of life. And God is the most maximally free entity we know and can experience. And these are not attributes of God in the way that like my eyes are brown and they are, they are a lovely shade of light brown. Or that my hair, the hair that I used to have at some point was wavy. No, these are parts of me. 
This is different from God. The, the, God as love and the source of life and God as freedom is all of who God is and God is all of who he is perfectly. And out of God's nature of love, God graciously gives us life and God made us free. Again, in previous sermons, I've, gone, I've given my own brief description of love, particularly God's love, which I would describe as seeking the highest good for the other. But what is freedom? Is it merely the absence of interference? Is it the ability or simply the freedom of choice? Most of us would say, well, yes, freedom is being able to decide for myself between various options. This, however, is a very modern Western idea. Freedom is being able to make my own choices. Now, this is different from a traditional theological, again, that word just means the way that we would think and talk about God. This is different from a traditional theological understanding of freedom. A traditional understanding of human freedom involves an understanding of a life transformed. I say this every week, but I'm going to say it again. Stick with me. I'm going somewhere. It's an understanding of a life transformed so as to live with a kind of ease, a kind of freedom of doing it easily, to live virtuously or in a holy way. Human freedom traditionally is understood as living in a holy way, in such a way that, will, uh, that wills for the good. And the will is trained to will for the good and being pleasing to God. In some sense, freedom is less concerned with a myriad of options than it is with a trajectory towards God. Understand what I'm saying. To be free is to be free to pursue God without the temptation of chasing other things. Amen. It's not freedom of choice or uh, will I follow Christ or do something else. It's a profound understanding of what actually is good and then conforming oneself throughout a lifelong process of maturity towards goodness. In fact, that there is some type of competition for what constitutes goodness is itself a lack of freedom. If you are tempted in a direction away from choosing the good, it is to be less free. In a weird way, having more options, you might be less free. I'll keep going. Freedom is a mind, a heart, and a will that is committed and oriented toward life, love, and freedom, simply toward God. It's a freedom of the self to simply desire God and nothing else. Freedom is a gift that belongs to you because it was given to you by God. You were made for freedom and its absence is evidence of death, of separation from God. Now, with this freedom, I'm not talking about the freedom to choose whether you're going to wear masks or not. I'm not talking about a freedom to, to vote or not to vote. I'm not even talking about whether or not you will go to A&M, UT, TCU, or Texas Wesleyan. I know Texas Wesleyan is probably at the bottom of the list in that list, but I went there, so it was going to make the list. Y'all just have to deal with that. Amen. amen. And amen again to the Rams. Rams strong. I got the mic, y'all don't. Rams strong. All right. I'm talking about a greater freedom. To be and to become all that God has meant for you to be. I'm talking about freedom in new life in Christ. Now, if you're sitting here listening to me, whether in person or watching online, then you may be asking yourself, man, this dude has said freedom like 15, 25, 30 times. Why am I harping on, so, on freedom as much as I am? I'm so glad you asked. In a real sense, what we're always talking about when we are talking about following Jesus is freedom. We are talking about freedom from sin. Over the last few weeks, the messages that we've been engaged in are like building blocks. Uh, as you know from the video that you just watched, and if you've been here for the last few weeks and watching online, then you know that we are engaged in the first season or collection of messages focused on a topic that we're calling real Christianity. We're exploring what it really means to follow 
Jesus. And the first season, in case you were wondering, could most easily be understood as simply becoming a Christian. That's the magic trick, guys. We aren't doing anything fancy. We're just talking about what it means to become a Christian. And we're exploring these ideas because some of us have been taught, and in truth, all of us have been exposed to the idea that becoming a Christian is an easy thing. Some of y'all are already looking at me and just, mm, mm, like you already know where I'm going. You say a few things, you take a few classes, you show up at the right time, go to the right services, and boom, you're a Christian. But a conviction of this season of messages is responding to the idea that if becoming a Christian is thought to be such an easy thing, why does the wider world wonder where the Christians can be found? I'll let that sit for a minute. To be clear, the wider world does have thoughts about the church, but there is a longing for the Christians. All right. I'll stop meddling. I'll just keep going. I, some of y'all are already looking at Pastor Julian. Don't do this to me right now. All right, I'll keep going. In truth, if you've been walking with Christ, then you know that being a Christian is not an easy task. Amen. I heard the amens that time. It is a life marked by growth and transformation. There, however, is a tendency to believe that freedom or new life in Christ is simply about being forgiven. There's a sense in which our tendency is to think of forgiveness as the end of the Christian life. Well, today I want to challenge that. I want to talk to you about forgiveness as the bridge to new life. This past week... um, I, was, I, was, I, I received a call from, uh, from a younger cousin of mine. Well, let me clarify that. It's my wife's younger cousin, but, but, but that's my guy. So he, he's my cousin too. I just adopted him when I said I do. All right, anyway, so I got a call from my cousin. Uh, over the years, uh, he and I have become really good friends, and he is now involved in, in, in student ministry at a church in Houston, uh, it's really cool to watch him grow into this new position as he's be becoming and developing as a Christian communicator and as a leader, and it's just it's really interesting. And because of the relationship we have and that he's involved in ministry and he's known that I've been in seminary, um, every now and again he'll send me messages. I'll even send him some of mine, and we'll just talk about messages and what, we, what, we're, what we're learning right now. And this past week he called me to talk about a recent message he gave to his group Uh, on forgiveness. And we talked about some of the ins and outs of forgiveness. He asked me a question about forgiveness and and reconciliation that really really forced me to think. And as I was responding to the question, I I reflected on on what I knew this week's message was going to be about. I knew what the focus was going to be for this week, and I offered this thought that's similar to something that I said last week. I said it earlier that God is love, and every movement of God is a movement of love. I really believe that. And that means that from creation to the cross, from chaos to community, from Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between, whatever God is doing is always an act of love because God is love. And in God's love, God is actively reconciling creation to God's self. And our capacity to forgive in as much as it is a, a, a requirement for us, uh, to our capacity to move forward in reconciliation and recovery is itself an expression of the love of God that reanimates us in the deepest places in our heart and soul. The forgiveness that is available to us in, from Christ through Christ's passion is itself a movement, however, toward something. It doesn't end there. Forgiveness, in every sense, always has a trajectory, namely relationship. It occurs to me that one of the challenges that we face is perhaps our unfinished understanding of forgiveness. For some of us, we believe, well, Christ died for my sin, which means I'm forgiven. So that means I'm I'm good. Some of us live as if forgiveness was the only goal, and once that happens— I can just go about and live my own life. I don't got to be involved with all the other things. But forgiveness is not the only goal. It's the way 
to the true goal, the true destiny of humanity, namely relationship or life with God. And isn't it funny how that works? Where, where we began is ultimately the same place which we are headed. Perhaps that's why that moment in the garden is referred to as the fall. We fell out of a relationship with God, and the image of God has since become fallen in us. But when Jesus fell, that is, when Jesus died, he didn't stay there. No, he got up, and because he got up, we can too. Yeah, that's an amen moment. That's a good one. That's an amen moment. This is, in part, the connective tissue throughout the entirety of the Bible, that everything goes back to Genesis in some sense, to the fall of humanity. And one of the problems that we face in our understanding of becoming a Christian is that somehow we have convinced ourselves of a distorted sense of the gospel. We tell ourselves, I'm basically good, but every now and again I mess up from time to time, But God, and some of y'all may have said this or heard this. If you said it, if you said it today, I apologize. But some of us give the excuse, but God knows my heart. God just knows my heart. So it's fine. It's all good. It's all good. And because God loves me, I'm his favorite. God loves me. And because God loves me, it's going to be fine. It's all good. I'll just ask for forgiveness to clean up that mess. And then me and the big man upstairs are good. It's fine. You know what? Turns out it's true. God does know our hearts. And that's kind of the problem. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And in spite of what we tell ourselves, God saw and sees us for what we truly are, broken, corrupted, and destitute in our very soul. And if we're honest, we know This world is broken, and we know that we are a part of the brokenness. We accept the idea that we are born in sin, but here is the strange difficulty. We tell ourselves that forgiveness is the only goal. I'll just ask for forgiveness, clean up that mess, say these words, and I'll really mean it. Like when I say it, I'm like, I'm going to bow my head, like get on my knees, and that means I really mean that I'm sorry. And then I'm done. I prayed now, and now I'll go back to living my best life. And the strange thing is, the unfortunate thing is that we've taught this to people. We have given this idea to people. We've tried to make following Jesus as as somewhat more accessible, as accessible as possible so that we can just get them in the church. It's almost as if, for some reason, we think Jesus somehow needs our help. In an effort to evangelize or for the sake of spreading the gospel, we've decided that we need to soften it and and make it more palatable, that we've tried to give Christianity some type of PR makeover. And we've made it all benefit without any obligation. And because it's so saturated in the marketplace, for lack of a better word, so many of us believe we're forgiven because we took the step. That we took this step on our own. And if that's the case, then it's us that really saved ourselves. Because that's what we do. We, we, we pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We take personal responsibility and we, we save ourselves by making our way to Jesus. Our significant problem is that we think that we can fix our own problems. We think that we can fix this life ourselves. And I said it last week, and it's worth saying again, that we can no more save ourselves than a dead man can revive himself. We need Jesus. We need him. Now, the text that we're in today, it tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does it mean, however? to be in Christ Jesus. I'm so glad you asked. This phrase only appears, I don't know if you know this, this phrase only appears in that form twice in the New Testament. In this passage, and then in 1 Peter 5, verse 10, which reads, peace to all you who are in Christ. And it's the one word in that sentence, 
in. What does it mean to be in? It seems to suggest a kind of locatedness, a position or repositioning. Now keep in mind, it doesn't say there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are close to Christ Jesus. It's about place, not proximity. So you've got to be in, apparently, Christ Jesus. This is a profound association. It's a shift in identity. And being in Christ is a radical change in where we've placed our faith and our fidelity. In fact, in Ephesians, we are told that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus and not by our own efforts or works. It requires faith in Christ. In fact, Pastor David reminded us last week that it requires faith in Christ's faithfulness. And this faith is even requires Christ for us to receive this faith. We can't, it takes God to help us have faith in Christ alone. We, let me say that differently. We can't get faith by osmosis. That's good. Some of y'all took science and it was not my favorite subject, but I got through it. I remember osmosis though. You don't, you don't get this faith by simply, uh, here I'm back to meddling again, coming to church once or twice a month and having a good feeling. Now those of y'all who do that, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not hating on y'all. I'm saying that's not it, okay? Faith itself, faith itself is a gift from God offered to all who earnestly seek after God. And the seeking is itself an expression of the God who desires closeness with you. Let me say that shorter. You chase God because God wants to be with you and the desire you have is itself a gift from God. That you desire God is God moving, actively working in your life and heart to realize you need God. And you don't Catch this faith by just being around the symbols and expressions of faith. You can't do it on your own. You even need God to have faith in Christ that removes the condemnation. And by this faith, we experience a radical change. By this faith, we find our way to freedom. While I was thinking about that, I actually thought about um, a text exchange that... uh, that Dylan and I have. So um, you all know Dylan. He leads our contemporary worship arts. Uh, and what you may not know uh, is Dylan is always thinking about or writing about music, like all the time. I've gotten texts at, at, at 6 in the morning and like 9 at night and everywhere in between. Just Dylan's focused on music. And so, and I'm not mad at it because I am too. I just don't get a chance to play that often. So uh, Dylan and I, every now and again, we'll both send each other texts of the music that we're kind of thinking about and working on and playing with and, and all of that. And um, uh, there was a point where he sent me the following photo along with an audio file of the basic motif of this song. Do we have that picture? Did I send it? I hope I sent it. There it is. All right, so this is a real text. You may, now you may not be able to make out the bottom line, but it says, I may be a great sinner, but Christ is a great savior. Amen. Now, that was followed by a really uh, strange, like, gif and meme from me. It's the way that I communicate with everybody. I think it was Mike Tyson nodding and smiling. But uh, I loved that line. I remember when he sent it it to me. I don't remember where I was, but I I was at my phone just going, hmm. I love the line because it positioned, um, it positioned the great forces in the life of the believer. My sin is great, but my God is greater. As good as I am at sinning, he is way better at healing. As good as I am at breaking things, He is greater at building things back up. 
And as great as I am at failing and falling, he is the resurrected one in whom my own resurrection is possible. And perhaps you are here today, whether in person or online, and you are thinking, if you only knew what I've done, if you only knew my past, if you only knew the shame that I carry with me right now, I imagine that with this many of us together, the, the odds are someone thinks that they have fallen too deep, gone too far, and is far too unlovable. You dress it up real nice, you have on your good makeup, you got on your good hair, you have the right car, you got the good house, all the things are right. You have all of the things that appear like you have it together, but inside you can barely sleep at night. You're afraid of being seen. You're afraid that if someone knew the rejection that would come from it. But let me remind you that you may be a great sinner, but God is a great Savior. And God desires relationship with you, and God is willing to go down to the depths of your greatest failure to bring you from death to light. There's no shadow he won't light up. I won't go there because I can't remember all the lyrics. <laughs> But there's no extent to where he will go with his profound, reckless love to bring you from death to life. And following Jesus brings with it new life. Everything, all of it, it's all about new life, a life with God. It's about life, love, and freedom. See, this, the past couple weeks we have been, Pastor David, he's mentioned it, he did a great job of defining it too in his sermon on last week, that we've basically been talking about two ideas, justification and sanctification. And when we are justified, which is when we are brought into right relationship with God, we are forgiven. It's that forgiveness and reconciliation with God that leads to regeneration, which is what we would commonly say to be born again. They are not the same thing, but they happen at the same time. When we are justified, it's the beginning of a new life in freedom that begins with the love of God being re-infused in our lives. So I would say that slightly differently. Justification is a bridge, not a destination. Forgiveness is a bridge, not a destination. It's a pathway to new life. And we should not stop in our life with Christ as just being forgiven. Christ wants more for you. He wants you to have more. The text always reminds us that Christ came so that we might have life and have life more abundantly. That's yours. It belongs to you. Where's Amanda? Amanda, come ahead and come up. So she's probably been waiting and hoping that I wouldn't do this, but I am going to do this. So did everybody get your, your, your finger trap? Yeah. All right. So in his sermon, in his sermon on bondage and adoption, John Wesley describes the difference this way. It's okay. We're both going to awkwardly stand here. So you, if you all watch the countdown, you know this is Amanda and I's bag. Just awkward moments together. So uh, in John Wesley's sermon on, on, on uh, bondage and adoption, he says this. Justification implies only a relative change. The new birth, a real change. The former, justification, changes our outward relation to God. From enemies, we become children. By the latter, new birth or regeneration, our inmost souls are changed. Justification restores us to the favor of God. Regeneration restores us to the image of God. In that same message, he describes uh, three different states of the soul. The natural person, the person under the law, and the person under grace. Now, the, the natural person is, Wesley describes as asleep. Did anybody, I mean, online, you can't raise your hand. If you're online with our host pastor, just raise your hand there. In person, does anyone remember the movie Baby's Day Out? Anyone? Yep. 
Okay, all right. There's like four people. Okay, cool. No problem. So this will be weird and it's going to be spoilers. All right, so Baby's Day Out. There's this, it's a baby that's having a day out. That's the movie. And so this baby <laughs> just ends up in all kinds of like danger. Like it's, it's, it can't walk. It can only crawl. Uh, there's these like thieves that are like trying to rob a house and the baby, it's like Home Alone but with an infant. And so... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and these, this baby ends up in all these precarious situations that ends up getting the thieves hurt. And at one point, the baby is like on a 40-foot tall building that's being built, like on a steel girder, just, just crawling around, chilling, not afraid, just unaware of his danger. And this is what Wesley doesn't talk about Baby's Day Out. But, but this is essentially the image. The natural, the natural person doesn't even realize how in danger they are. Wesley describes them as asleep, uh, and they are in a dream world, just living and enjoying, and there's a certain level of peace because they don't know. And then there is the person under the law, and this person is trapped. I see where I'm going. All right, so you're going to have to do this because I was terrified that I was going to get my finger stuck, and so uh, I told Amanda she had to come up here. All right. So this is a finger trap. Many of you got them as children. I, I, I said when we were outside, let's not give people five in case someone gets their whole hand stuck. And then we have to give it. I've watched it on YouTube. People have done it. And so I didn't want us to have to get like scissors to have to cut people out of the finger traps. But there's an interesting, if you've, if you've gotten a finger trap, if you know anything about the finger trap, you know that it actually really works. Hence the reason why I have someone to do this for me. And there's a sense in which a person who is in the trap, I'm not going to do it, I'm just going to be alongside her, is, is caught in the trap. Now, the instinct of the person in the trap, because they are stuck, because they are enslaved to the trap and aware of their enslavement, is to pull with all the force they can to try to get out of the trap. And if you've been stuck in this finger trap, you know it doesn't matter how hard you pull, you cannot get out. You can't get out simply with brute force or your own strength. That you're in a kind of bondage, and in the bondage, your tendency is to pull away. And Wesley says that the, the, the man under the law does this. He's aware of his enslavement, and because he wants to be free from the bondage, he pulls and pulls and pulls. But the, the longer he pulls, the more enslaved he becomes. And the fear and the bondage grows with his pulling at the trap. But if you know anything about this trap, then you know the way out is to go in. You've got to lean in in order to find your way. Were you able to get out? Oh, she got out. Okay, cool. I was like, this is going to be really <laughs> non-cathartic if she gets stuck in this trap. So... <laughs> In fact, you've got to go further in than you've ever gone in order to get out like you were before, better than you were before the bondage. And this is the freedom that we have in Christ. In order to get out of the trap and the bondage and the power of sin, we've got to go in to Christ in order to find our way out. You cannot do it on your own. You need agency beyond you, far beyond you, that cares about your loose fingers. To get out, again, Amanda, you're free. You can go. <laughs> and the forgiveness that we experience in Christ is simply about recognizing our need to go in. The truth of the matter is we are forgiven. Musicians, you all can come back up. We are forgiven. And that forgiveness is a relative change. It changed our disposition, our relationship, our relate, how we relate to God, our ability to relate to God is changed by forgiveness. And our relationship with God is repaired. But forgiveness is just the beginning. It's not the end. It's a beginning to a new life in Christ, a way of existence filled with new life, with deep love, and finally, thanks be to God, unrestrained freedom. In Christ, we find freedom from the power 
of sin. In Christ, we find freedom from the penalty of sin. And ultimately, in this life that we live with Christ, one day, we will also find freedom from even the very presence of sin. Let's pray. God, thank you that you invite us into closer relationship with you. You invite us to move into our sin with you in order to get our way out of our sin. And that as strong as sin may have been in us, God, as great as our sin may have been, God, you are a great Savior. You are a great healer. You are the resurrected one that can move dead people to life, to make dry bones live again, God. And we ask that you make us live. Make us free. Give us the joy of experiencing your love and embracing and holding on to your love that we may share it with others. Make our lives transformed, God. Love us in such a way that you don't leave us the way that you found us. And because of your great love and this new life and profound freedom, God, we, we will live in light of it and we will tell a dead world about a risen Savior. We are nobodies just trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. So God, make us free. Help us to see our freedom and to choose to love you, God, to choose to go with you, God, to refuse to do this life without you. And then by our lives in partnership, in league, in concert, in communion with you, our world and the world around us would be forever changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.